So kinetic molecular theory is the simplest model for the behavior of gases. In this theory, we model the gas as a collection of particles. Those could be molecules or atoms, depending on what the gas is. And these particles are in constant motion. So here we have an illustration of a flask containing a gas. And the little uh, vapor trails or whatever here show that these are moving. So these little particles are moving. They're just moving in a straight line until they run into something. They're not going through air because they are the air. Right? So they are traveling through nothing. They can collide with each other. They can collide with the walls of the flask. They travel in a straight line until they run into something. The size of the particle is negligibly small. Those particles do have size. They have volume, but those, the size of the particle is so small relative to the size of the whole gas that it doesn't matter at all. Right? There's a lot of empty space. So just as an example, at STP, argon atoms occupy only 0.01% of the volume of the gas. If the argon atom was the size of a golf ball, its nearest neighbor would be four feet away. So you've got an argon atom, and four feet away is the closest one, and in between is nothing. There's really just nothing in there, right? So the size of the particles doesn't matter. The average kinetic energy of those particles is directly proportional to the temperature in Kelvin. Temperature is actually the measure of the average kinetic energy of a substance. Particles are moving, even in a solid, they're just vibrating. But here in the gas, they are actually traveling through space. When you raise the temperature of the gas, the average speed of the particles increases. But it's important to remember that not, not all gas articles <laughs> are moving at the same speed. I already fixed that. Not all gas particles are moving the same speed. Um, when particles collide with each other or when they collide with the walls of the container, those collisions are completely elastic. That's a physics term. What that means is when they, when they collide with each other, they don't lose any energy. Energy can be transferred from one to the other, but no energy is lost. And as the particles travel through space, they're not experiencing any friction. And so unlike real sized objects like baseballs or billiard balls, these things are moving and they, they keep moving without any source of energy. They have kinetic energy and they're moving and they're gonna bump into stuff and they're just gonna bounce off and they're not gonna slow down. So they can exchange energy, but they don't lose energy. It's kind of weird to think about. So here's an illustration of an elastic collision. Billiard balls on a pool table are relatively elastic in their collisions. So here you have two balls being rolled towards each other, and they collide and they bounce off of each other, and they're both moving still. You can compare that to rolling a couple of lumps of clay to each other. The lumps of clay, even, you know, those obviously aren't gonna roll because they're not round. But if you made them nice and round, they would roll perfectly fine. But when they ran into each other, because clay is soft, it's just gonna go whoop and just absorb all of that energy and stop dead. That is an inelastic collision where the kinetic energy is lost to heat gas particles react or collide in an elastic way where the total kinetic energy before is the same after. Now, this particle might have gained and this lost, but the total energy is the same. Anybody have any questions about that? So gas particles are inelastic? Gas particles have elastic oh, collisions, elastic. yeah. There's no energy loss to heat when they collide. They just bounce off. Just like that ancient game, computer game, Pong, where that little blip can just go and go and go and go, right? It bounces off the walls, it bounces off the little paddle, it never slows down. 
no gravity, nothing. So kinetic molecular theory can explain a lot of the things we observe about gases, and that's what theories do, they explain things. Um, so we can understand gas pressure, talking about kinetic molecular theory, and we have, you know, it's abbreviated in the slides KMT because it's just a lot of letters. So the gas particles are constantly moving. They're going to strike the sides of the container. When they strike, they have a force. And so the result of lots of particles hitting the walls of the container is a pressure, a force divided by the area. So each of those collisions is really, really tiny, but there are so many of them that they become significant. So if you think about rain, which we could use some rain, one drop of rain, is that going to get you very wet? No, you might not even notice it. But if it's raining and you're standing out in the rain and lots and lots and lots of drops hit you, you get soaking wet, right? Because there's so many of them. So it's a little bit like these gas particles and their collisions. Each collision is a tiny thing, but there's so many of them that it's basically a flood of raindrops. We can look at the simple gas laws. Boyle's law, the volume of a gas is proportional, inversely proportional to the pressure. So if we decrease the volume of the gas, now the molecules are forced into a smaller space. Their temperature is the same, so they're moving at the same speed. They're going to bump into the sides of the container more frequently. Okay? So increased pressure. Decreasing the volume increases the pressure. <coughs> Anybody have questions about that? Charles Law says the volume is directly proportional to the absolute temperature. So if we increase the temperature of the gas, then the average speed of the particles increases. Now they're moving faster. For Charles Law, we have to maintain a constant pressure. If the particles are moving faster, they're going to run into the container more frequently and each collision is going to be harder, that would cause the pressure to go up. But we need the pressure to be the same. So the only way to maintain the constant pressure is to let the gas occupy a larger volume. So if we increase the temperature at constant pressure, the volume of the gas will increase. Avogadro's law says the volume of a gas is directly proportional to the number of gas molecules. Well, if we increase the number of gas molecules in a sample, there's more gas molecules in there. They're going to hit the sides more frequently. The pressure is going to increase. Avogadro's law is at constant pressure. In order to maintain a constant pressure, we have to increase the volume. Dalton's law about mixtures. Like molecular theory can explain this as well. Dalton's law says that the total pressure of a gas is the sum of the partial pressures of each of the gases. So the particles of the gas have negligible size. They don't interact with each other. They collide, but they just bounce off. They don't, you know, have conversations or get into relationships or anything. They just bounce off of each other. So if we have particles of different masses in a, a mixture of gases, two different gases, those particles are going to have different masses. But they're going to have the same average kinetic energy. That just means that the, if the mass is different, then their velocities must also be different. Their kinetic energies are the same. So because the average kinetic energy is the same, then the total pressure of the collisions is the same. kinetic energy is equal to one-half the mass times the velocity squared. So if you have a large particle, it's going to be moving more slowly 
to have a given kinetic energy. If you have a small particle, it'll be moving faster to have the same kinetic energy. So you can have two kinds of particles. One's bigger than the other, but they have the same kin average kinetic energy. <coughs> the large particles are moving more slowly. The small particles are moving more quickly. But when they collide with things, they exert the same force. And so it doesn't matter what size the particles are. They're all at the same temperature. They're going to exert the same pressure. Um, not really, not really. And there will be a lot of equations given for this exam because there's a bunch of equations. Right? Um, what about the um, ideal gas law? So kinetic molecular theory is a quantitative model and it implies the ideal gas law. If you're interested in that, the textbook has the full mathematical derivation of that. I'm not going to test you on that, and I think most of you aren't interested in that, so I'm not going to cover it in lecture. But it's there in the textbook if you are interested. And if you have questions about it, I'll be happy to talk to you outside of lecture. Um, the theory predicts that the behavior, I'm sorry, the theory predicts behavior that is consistent with the observations and the measurements that we have made. And so that means that as far as, as we know, kinetic molecular theory is a good description of how gases behave. Scientific theory is the most powerful kind of scientific knowledge. We do observe that the model breaks down under certain conditions, but when we examine those conditions and why the model's breaking down, it actually gives us more understanding into the behavior of gases. So the average kinetic energy depends on the mass and the average velocity. I sketched that in in an earlier slide, but there it is. Kinetic energy is one half the mass times the velocity squared. So if we have different masses of particles, the only way for them to have the same kinetic energy is for them to have different velocities. Now the velocity here, we actually are talking about an average velocity, and it's called URMS. Um, that's the root mean square velocity, and it's just a fancy kind of an average. So the root mean square velocity is close to the regular average velocity. We're not going to worry about the details of that. Um, we can calculate the root mean square velocity of, a, of gas particles um, using this equation. We find that the velocity is proportional to the square root of the temperature in kelvins times the ideal gas constant times 3 divided by the molar mass of the particles. Now here, the R that we're using needs to have different units. And so we're using a value of R that's 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Capital M here is the molar mass of the particle in kilograms per mole. Kilogram is the base unit in the, in the SI system. Um, and so to get the units to work out, it has to be kilograms. So this is showing variation of velocity distribution with molar mass, relative number of particles with an indicated velocity versus the different molecular velocities. So at a given temperature, we could look at the velocity of oxygen particles, and they would um, make this, it's basically a bell curve, right? And so we'd see that most of the gas particles have velocities in here, some of them are moving faster, some of them are moving slower. But the average matches with the temperature. Um, the average kinetic energy of all of these gases is the same. Helium particles are moving much, sorry, that's hydrogen. 
Hydrogen particles are moving at a faster average speed, but that's because their mass is so much less. So 1 half mv squared, if you do that for each of these gases, you'll come up with the same value. The point of this slide is that there's a difference in the distribution. For a very small particle, we get a very broad distribution of speeds, velocities. Some are very high, some are very low. With a heavier particle, the distribution is more narrow. There's less variation in their speeds. If we look at the effect of temperature on the distribution of gas velocities, we find that as we increase the temperature, the distribution spreads out as well. So at a lower temperature, the velocity distribution will be narrow, and as you increase the temperature, it spreads out. So let's do an example. Calculate the root mean square velocity of gaseous xenon atoms at 25 degrees Celsius. So the equation that we're using, which I do not expect you to memorize, So on the, um, in the table of useful information that I give you for the exam, I would give you both of these values for the gas constant. I'll give you this equation. So this is root mean square velocity, xenon atoms at 25 degrees Celsius. I need the temperature. The temperature has to be in Kelvin. So the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. We're going to add 273 and come up with 298 Kelvin. Capital M here is the molar mass. What's the molar mass of xenon atoms? Yeah, 131. I'm going to round it to 131.3. Yeah, so that's in grams per mole. Um, in this equation, this has to be in kilograms per mole, and I'll show you why in a minute. So how do we convert that to kilograms? So 1,000 grams is 1 kilogram. So this would be 0.1313 kilograms per mole. Remembering to convert the molar mass to kilograms is the trickiest part of this. So my root mean square velocity is 3 times, and I want to use this 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, and the temperature is 298 Kelvin, and that's divided by the molar mass in kilograms per mole. Square root of the whole thing. So we can do the math. three significant figures, 237.92. Anybody else get that number? What about the units? Well, let's see what happens with the units. Um, the Kelvins are going to cancel, right? And here I have... Um, 
joules over moles and in the denominator kilograms over moles the moles are going to cancel and so my unit ends up being the square root of joules per kilogram that doesn't look like a speed or a velocity but note, one joule is one kilogram meter squared per second squared. So this guy, a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. So there's my joule divided by kilograms square root of the whole mass. Kilograms cancel out, square root of meters squared per second squared, the units are meters per second. Now some of you are interested in that, it's like, cool, right, yeah. And some of you are like, what the heck did you just do? You don't have to understand that. Pardon me? Yes. Yeah, so I have um, the square root of m squared over s squared, and so when I take that square root, I get m over s. No, I mean up top. Up here? Yeah. Yeah, I took the square root of the numbers. <coughs> well, I'm just showing how the, you mean over here in the units? I'm just showing how this mess of units is going to work out. So that is, I didn't really leave any space for that, but this is equal to 238 meters per second. Yeah. So if you're doing this, you always need your molar mass in kilograms? Yep. Yeah, you have to have your molar mass in kilograms. The reason is so that all these units come out correctly. In the SI system, kilogram is the base unit for mass. And so a lot of these other units, like joule, involves a mass, a, a length, and a speed. I'm sorry, a time. And things like a newton is a unit of force, and that can be expressed as, an, as a joule times a meter. And so all of these derived units are related to each other. So if you understand that, awesome. If you don't, you just need to remember that this M has to be in kilograms, not grams. And then the units will work out and you have a nice metric unit of velocity meters per second. Two thirty eight meters per second. Here's a conceptual question. Which sample of an ideal gas has the greatest pressure? Assume that the mass of each particle is proportional to its size in the picture and that all the gas samples are at the same temperature. So we see that there's different sizes. This is much bigger, right? So this must have a larger mass. But what else is different? What's different about A and C? It looks like their particles are the same size. There's more here, right? more particles. So if the particles are the same size, but you have more of them, is the pressure going to be greater or less? Greater. So the pressure of this one is going to be greater than that one. We're looking for the greatest pressure, so it's not going to be that one. And then looking at these two, um, does, does the size of these particles affect the pressure? Well, it, it, they have the same temperature. So they have the same average kinetic energy. So these particles are heavier, so they're moving slower but they're at the same energy. And so the, 
the pressure from this one is the same as the pressure from that one because the pressure depends on the number of particles, not their size. So these two are actually equal to each other. And this is the highest pressure. Ask me questions about that. Because I know, yes. So the way that you would make that one have the same pressure is if you increase the size of the box? Yes. Yes, I could make this one have the same pressure as these, but I'd have to change the volume. I'd have to make the volume larger. Anybody have any questions? These little gas molecules are moving faster. When they hit the container, it's like a little punch, like a little kindergartner punching you, right? But they're moving very quickly, and so they're hitting you a lot. And then here are the big guys, maybe the sixth graders, right? And they can punch you harder, but they're slow. And so every time they hit you, it's harder, but it's not happening as often. The pressure ends up being the same, though. I don't know if that helps or not. <laughs>